This is Guitar Business Radio, the podcast for the business of guitar. No reviews, no demos, no idle chatter, just useful dialogue and information to help you get the most out of your guitar-related business. Whether you're a guitar builder or a guitar player, or just something in between, this is for you. Now, here's your host. Oh, wait, it's me, Jeffrey D. Brown. So let's get to it. This is episode 13 of GBR, and no, we didn't skip over it and go directly to the 14th floor, although I will discuss episode 14 in a moment. But today, we'll be spending some time with Jamie Gale, who is responsible for bringing his boutique guitar showcase to NAM shows and major cities around the USA and Europe. He's been involved with many world-class boutique guitar makers around the world for many years, and he'll give us some interesting insights on all of that in just a few moments. You know, we really appreciate your feedback on everything we're doing, and often that input gives us reason to make some positive changes. And one that we just implemented is on what we call the Episodes page on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com. This is effectively the index page for all the shows and was originally laid out when we didn't have many episodes, like two or three. But now, with 13 episodes and a trailer and a new one coming out every week, Uh, We needed to reconfigure it to make it easier for you to see all the episodes and make a quick selection on which one you want to listen to at the moment and to get more information on what we call the show page. So check that out the next time you're on the site. Also, after the interview in the value shot, we'll be continuing our discussion on taking your business or career to the next level as I talk about leveraging your knowledge. And remember, you can get special access to all the value shot segments with written transcripts when you join us on Patreon. Now, I'm happy to say that we're getting a lot more interest from folks wanting to come on the show, and I have to believe that's a positive sign, but I want to reemphasize the fact that while we obviously have only limited opportunities to do full interviews on the show, it's not the only option. You can now submit your own Guitar Business Minute, which actually can be about 30 to 90 seconds. And if it sounds good, we'll likely include it on an episode of GBR. Anyone can do this. But if you like, we'll even professionally produce your minute for you when you become a Guitar Business Executive on Patreon. Give some thought to that, and you can get more information on our Participate page on the website. And finally... Just a little preview of next week's show, episode 14, that comes out Monday, May 14th. We have a great interview with the owner of Breedlove Guitars, Bedell Guitars, and Weber Mandolins. And of course, I'm talking about Tom Bedell, who will share a lot about his own history and how he got back into the business a little over a decade ago and what he has built ever since. Very interesting stuff, so don't miss that. Now, for something of really epic proportions. This is your source for profoundly interesting news briefs. Guitar Business Radio presents The Shorts. So clearly the big news of the week was the not very unexpected move by Gibson to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. And so I guess they will now be added to the ongoing Journal of Famous Bankruptcies, which I presume somebody must be publishing somewhere. Now, as I said many episodes ago when the Gibson talk was heating up, that the brand was not going anywhere, but things would probably change. It now appears that when the company emerges from Chapter 11, which I assume it will, it will be a slimmed down, back-to-basics organization returning to its roots, producing, I don't know, guitars, you think? (laughs) By the way, for those of you who've been listening to me for a while now, uh, you know that I'm a big advocate for simplicity. That doesn't mean bare bones, starve yourself from life simplicity, but more in line with simplicity of purpose and clarity of thought. And so in some respects, the move by Gibson seems to be a move in that direction. I doubt they were influenced in any way by my words in the value shot, but it's always nice to see real world examples of the ideas that you're pushing out there. One thing I may add about all of this is that Henry has received a lot of criticism, and I'm not going to join the pack on that here. No need for it. But in business, growth comes in many forms and quite often requires us to do different things, go in different directions, and take risks, big and small. You know, we can speculate on motives and competency all we want, but it's hard to believe there was any intent to drive the company into the ground. Sometimes things just don't work out. 
and more changes are required. What that means is the spaghetti didn't stick to the wall and now some cleanup is needed before we start cooking again. Now, as we leave Metaphor Village and continue on our tour, I wanted to circle back with a quick update on two guitar-related crowdfunding projects I mentioned a couple of episodes ago. I originally said I would report back in a month, but out of curiosity, I went out and checked on both of them just to see what progress, if any, had taken place. Now, both of these projects, Alkie Guitars and Pitch Pilot, both had a bit less than a month to go on their campaigns. What kind of surprised me was that there has been virtually no change in either one in terms of additional funding commitments. The main difference between the two is that Alkier had already met their goal by a small amount, and I would have expected them to continue to raise money. And the other one, Pitch Pilot, was and still is at 3% of goal. And it's probably a safe bet that they're going to have to take a different path. Some things just don't work out. But for now, Here's something completely different. Well, in his career so far, Jamie Gale has been seen as an artist, retailer, gallerist, curator, distributor, manufacturer, and consultant in the guitar business. But more recently, he's probably best known for bringing many of the world's most innovative guitar makers together in a collective manner to NAM shows, as well as many major cities around the globe. He's the creator and curator of the Boutique Guitar Showcase, and we'll hear about that and much more as Jamie Gale joins us right here and right now. Well, Jamie, thanks for coming on the show with us today. It's great to have you. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, let's uh, just dig in. I mean, that's how we get started here. So, and um, what seems to be kind of a tradition here, I always like to start off with a little understanding of what kind of foundation your business or career is is built on. Usually it seems to start early on, but uh, what can you tell us about that part of your life that got you onto the path to where you are now? Uh, I think all of it. Um, As as most of us in the music industry, it started uh, quite young with simply a a passion for music, um, playing. You know, I I played uh, a lot uh, as uh, well, kind of my early teens, I guess. I mean, I literally wouldn't put down the guitar; I'd fall asleep with it. I'd walk my dogs <laughs> with the guitar. Uh, Do you have any picture? <laughs> are there any pictures of that anywhere? <laughs> no, I hope not. <laughs> but you know, it, it was a, it was an obsession. It was before the internet and all of that. And most of us had something that we were really into. And for and for me, it was uh, it was music. It wasn't just guitar. It was uh, it was drums and, and bass and and guitar, all of, all of the above. And so, um, you know, that, uh, that, that carried on, you know, a nonconformist to the core. Uh, I was always interested in uh, the things that others weren't. And to my own detriment, if, uh, if things became too popular, that, I, that uh, I'd start to dislike them. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Which I, I think later on in life, I'm a little more mature about that. But uh, earlier on, that was, you know, that was it. It's a bit contrary that way. So, uh, you know, eventually I got pretty good. And uh, I... I made music and other people wanted to, to hear it and, uh, and pay for it. And so next thing you know, we're, we're playing in bands and we're on the road and I've had the good fortune to, uh, to play all over North America and Europe. And, um, you know, that's really where it sort of starts, right? Sure. Uh, later course. on in life, um, I ended up, you know, uh, with the, the curiosity of uh, different instruments and, um, buying and selling things on the side and, Eventually, there was a, a, a gentleman who was quite old. Um, at the time, he was 77 and suffering from mania. And uh, his kids had power of attorney, and he needed out of his music store real bad. And so a young guy he thought was capable and made me a deal I couldn't refuse. And next thing you know, my wife and I, we owned, we owned a music store. Um, and that was where at, uh, Jamie? Uh, that was in a suburb of Toronto. Um, so a place called Oakville okay. in Canada. Okay. And... Uh, a nice affluent area, uh, so there was lots of possibilities there. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, we started. A, we took over this music shop, and uh, next thing you know, it was a growing concern. And uh, we started a guitar school and uh, drums and everything else. And next thing you know, we went from you know zero students to 180 in the first 90 days to 600 in the first two years. Wow! Uh, coming through every week. That's pretty and, good uh, growth. Pretty good growth. Pretty good growth. Pretty good growth. And it was. Uh, you know, we had a, a little business um, that was, you know, kind of a really an old junk shop, frankly. But we cleaned it up and 
we went from 180,000 a year to a million dollars a year within the first three years, I think it was. Now, what and, uh, uh, just so for time reference, uh, what what years yeah. what years were was that uh, did that get started in? Sure, that was um, 2001. Okay, mm-hmm. is when that started. Um, and, uh, you know, normally I don't say all those numbers, but I, this is guitar business radio, right? So I thought I should get this is, business stuff. We are all <laughs> business, but, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't have fun with it. And, uh, we're reaching out to a pretty broad audience, as I've said, uh, to you and, and others, it's from guitar builders to guitar players and anybody in between yep. that touches, uh, the business side of the guitar. So, um, you're right on that. But yeah. that, but that yeah. got you into the the, the, the real retail. business side of things besides playing. That's right. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Um, you know, what, that was the beginning of what we were really seeing as large expansions with stores uh, taking over other stores and such. And up in Canada, you know, there's uh, Long McQuaid, which is the equivalent to Guitar Center in the U.S., I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they were starting to acquire other stores, and uh, they acquired the store that was close to this little business, and then another store acquired a store that was on the other side, and there were no lines available all of a sudden. Mm. And, uh, and this store was mainly full of used things, but I was turning the inventory much faster than the previous owner was, and it wasn't coming in fast enough. So we had to look for a solution for inventory. Uh, and that uh, really was the beginning of what we do today. Uh, and that is I started to look for things that no one else had to separate myself. Okay, that makes and, sense. Uh, and then I started to go to the NAMM show, and I started to travel to Music Mesa, which very few North Americans were going to Music Mesa in uh, in Germany, the European show. And um, uh, and that's where I met uh, Nick Huber and Yu Harper Kangas and Jens Ritter and Pajeli and Teufel and many people that ultimately were a big part of shaping Sure. Um, my career and, and me a part of shaping theirs. You know, we sort of grew up together. And kind of big uh, names in, in that um, in in that segment of the market. You know, which was still I don't know if you'd say it was in its infancy, but but the boutique market as we know it today probably you know started out with some of those guys. Uh, am I right on that? Yeah, I mean they were all new at that time, and that was you know um, most of those guys are about twenty years in so far at this stage, a little more than twenty years, and I met them when they were about four or five years in, and so. As I said, we sort of came up together in this. Um, they weren't famous really at that point in time. In fact, the first guitar that Nick Hoover sold in North America was to me. You know, and then, right? uh, okay, wow. yeah, yeah, and um, you know, and I became the first, you know, in Canada, anyways, for Jens Ritter and Rakangas and uh, Michael Tobias and a number of American dealers also. And that sort of became our niche. We started, you know, doing things that no one else really had, and then. Uh, that really sort of carried on. That was, uh, we got into more and more high end instruments. And next thing you know, I opened up an art gallery to show guitar and sculptural art. And we showed Jens Ritter's Royals collection at that point in oh, time. And, wow. Uh, that was a fascinating part of what we do. And, and that was back in 2007. And, uh, and we're still working on the guitar and sculptural arts. This year's NAMM show, we, uh, we did four art installations and as a, an active part of my life and pursuit and what we're doing. So, yeah, it was the uh, it was the store, Jeff, uh, and then the art gallery, and then I was asked to help someone else out in the distribution business, uh, manufacturing. You know, we were importing guitars from around the world and cymbals, and, and next thing you know, I was designing cymbals and drums and guitars. And so it's not uh, been, as you say, it's not it. been entirely limited to guitars, but guitars certainly a a significant factor in it. Sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. The, the modern instruments. I, I play the modern instruments. You know, if it's in a rock band, I play it basically. You know, I, I don't do saxophone or anything like that, but you know, guitar, bass, drums, mm-hmm. sing, bit of keyboards. You know, so that's what I know. That's where I've been. Uh, and I guess ultimately, uh, once you've been in all those areas, um, people start to want to, some advice for how you how you are able to recognize the needs of a of a retailer and the needs of a distributor and uh, and a manufacturer and and all that. And that's where I ultimately, I guess, have become valuable to people like uh, the NAMM show or the European Guitar Business Association. So you, you've, got, you've gotten into, um, I guess, what we might generally call consulting, right? I mean, you've worked with a number of people to help them do better, it sounds like. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because you've, you've you know, I had a, a couple of other questions that I wanted to cover uh in the beginning here, but but you've kind of gone over 
a lot of that. So I think I want to jump ahead because I want to spend some time talking about uh, this project you've created called the Boutique Guitar Showcase. Uh, and this has gained a lot of traction over the last year or so. So mm-hmm. I wonder if you could uh, just give us a broad sense uh, and then we can go into some of the details, but how, how this all got started and then how it's evolved uh, over this fairly short period of time and some of the interesting anecdotal things that um, uh, I understand that from talking to you that uh, that you've gone through. So it's, a, I think, uh, just a, a great thing that you've been doing. So uh, love to hear more about it. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the Boutique Guitar Showcase actually started, well, like much of my career with a request. Usually I've been asked to help in things. And, uh, and it's the same thing here. Uh, the NAM show, which um, a lot of people don't realize is a not-for-profit organization, but uh, they are, and uh, and they are mandated to take care of the music industry. Uh, and what has become apparent to the uh, the NAM show, uh, NAM organization, in the last few years is the tremendous growth of the small guitar makers throughout the world. Uh, however, they're they're uh, they're growing much faster than they're coming to the NAM show, and they noticed that there were hundreds, maybe thousands, of small guitar makers that weren't coming to the show and they thought, okay, clearly we're not meeting their needs somehow and we need to because it's part of what we're supposed to do. And so how can we find a better way to take care of these small guitar makers needs? Uh, and as is their way, um, they look for a subject matter expert as they would say. And, uh, and that led them to me. So because of my history as a sales agent and a retailer mm-hmm. and such for many of these brands. And so it was a bit of an exploration really. It was, uh, okay, well, why don't they come to the show? And I, I knew a lot of the reasons just from having the conversations over many years. And certainly finance is, a, is an issue, I'm one of them. Absolutely. So, um, you know, to come to the NAM show, up until uh, my consultation with them, the smallest space you could get was a 10 by 10 space, 10, 10 feet by 10 feet, you know, and uh, you don't need that much space to show guitars, a small guitar maker, um, but they charge by the square foot. Uh, and that was so that meant that the minimum buy in to get into the show was about thirty five hundred dollars before you get to carpet or electricity or a table <laughs> or signage or anything else. And then it's five uh, and it's so five really, grand right away, just about. Realistically the NAM show was five grand on a shoestring, frankly. Right. Um you know, and that's uh, you know, and then you got to get there. Thing. You got to get there, and that's you got to right. pay your expenses. So it's really ten grand. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, yeah, it it can be. Uh, you know, it can be a lot of money for a small guitar maker who's who's used to buying a table for, I don't know, I think the average guitar show, traditional show, um, is about $750 for a table. Mm-hmm. And so when you're used to hearing $750 and then you hear $3,500 plus, 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 uh, it's a bit hard for these guys to imagine how it could possibly be worth that for them. Yeah, where does uh, so the ROI yeah. You know. yeah, where does the ROI come in? <laughs> You know, it's like what that's, right, that's right. You know, and then once you get there, you know, it's a huge show, 115,000 people plus this last year. Uh, and so how do you make a noise in that space and get attention? You know, how do you, there are people who show up and end up, you know, just in the wrong position because they didn't know any better. And you booked a booth space because you looked at a two dimensional map and you said, okay, that one there, because I want to be close to the bathroom or whatever, whatever your choice was, you know? Uh, and next thing you know, you're, you find yourself between two metronome manufacturers that have a thousand metronomes all turned on, you know, uh, an exercise in madness, you know, and across from a neighbor who, you know, is demoing their instruments at a loud volume all day. And, and you have a bad first experience uh, and you spend a lot of money to get there. And so uh, I knew that we need to make sure that these things don't happen. And so, uh, in the end, uh, the solution was what has become the Boutique Guitar Showcase, where we made the power of uh, the collective, the movement. So let's bring a number of people together who can benefit from one electrical drop, you know, who can share some demo room costs, yeah. right? Because we, so you can have a spot to hear an acoustic guitar or to crank up an amplifier. You need a separate sort of room for that, really. Uh, and collectively, we can disperse the cost of a demo room together, you know, amongst the guitar makers and uh, and making a clean image and getting in the right place. And, you know, a small guitar maker is not going to end up on the main aisle at the NAV show. However, when we make a collective of 30 of them, well, now we can get on the main aisle, you know, across from the big boys and, uh, and get the right attention. So 
uh, all these things sort of came together and we made it easy for them. You know, a lot of people come to the NAM show because it's a global show, um, don't necessarily speak uh, English fluently and have to read all these documents and such. And yeah. so uh, actually the boutique guitar showcase at the NAM show, um, even the application I've tailored to make it easier for guitar makers um, for NAM, cut out all sorts of different stuff. Now, and just now, you, got more to the point. you got started in uh, 2017, which was unfortunately the year that I couldn't make it, even though I'm like 20 minutes from uh, yeah. the Anaheim Convention Center. Uh, but I did see it this year for the first time and was was really amazed. And that's ultimately, of course, what led me to you. But uh, how did that come about in 2017? Uh, you said it was almost a last minute kind of thing. Yeah, well, really, the consultation had just started uh, 2016, a few months before the 17th show. The 17th show, for those who don't know, it, it's in January. So when it's a 2017, we really mean it's right at the end of 16, at the beginning of 17. And so, um, you know, we started the consultation then. And I started to get these uh, these emails from a number of European guitar maker friends of mine saying, hey, Jamie, we're coming to the NAMM show. And I got a message from a couple of uh, guys who are German guitar makers who were coming for the first time. I said, hey, we booked uh, in the German section. We're so excited. And I said, no, <laughs> no, that's not a good spot for you. You know, you don't need to be between accordions and harmonicas with people in Lederhosen. You know, it's, that's uh, right. it's <laughs> the German government provides a bit of uh, uh, they, they help financially, a bit of a grant for them. But it's not the right spot for you to show your electric guitars, frankly. Uh, and so they said, oh, can you help me get into a better spot? I said, sure. And then, you know, Uli Teufel and uh, a couple other guys contacted me saying, hey, we want to come to NAMM. And next thing you know, I had, I don't know, a half a dozen or 10 people who were looking for help getting the right placement. And NAMM said, James, if, we, if we're finding this many spots, how about we run a, a test run of the boutique guitar showcase in 17? And so also that's what we decided to do. But really it came together in about five or six months. And uh, the talent we got for that show, I mean, Really, we had, you know, Uli Teufel and Michael Spalt and Steve Klein and Andy Manson and Jason Koss. We had so many fantastic guitar makers, and, uh, Matt Suda, um, that came together in such a short period of time that, um, well, frankly, it's, it's amazing it happened. <laughs> wow. um, but it was a great opportunity and they saw, they saw that. And so, uh, and it worked. It worked really well for everyone. And how many so, did you I have think, in that first year? You said uh, 25, yeah. I think, 25, 26, okay. around there. And really, it was wildly successful. Like it was 73% of the guitar makers in the BGS sold guitars at the NAMM show. And uh, I don't know, Jeff, if you're familiar with what happens at traditional guitar shows, but you know, guitar shows <laughs> do not have 73% of the people selling guitars. Yeah, that's no, I've been, I've been to plenty. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so that's a that's a really good uh, I don't outcome. don't mean to diminish those shows. I mm -hmm. just mean this was really exceptional. Oh, it's apples and oranges. Yeah. So. yeah, and that's the thing that people don't really get until you've been to the damn show. So, you know, you look at it and say, oh, it's going to cost, you know, so much. And, I mean, through the BGS, and actually NAM now offers spaces that are in five-foot depth um, so that people can afford to come to the show. Uh, and really, I think you can get in for about 2500 bucks now as opposed to 5000 all in. Big, big um, there are 1,500 members of the press wow. that come to the NAMM show. Well, I didn't realize it was 30, that 30,000 artists. There's, there's 115,000 plus people that come to the show. And so to compare it to any other show in the world is just not fair. It's not fair to the other shows, frankly. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, and so when you compare your table for, as I said, 700 bucks or something of the sort at a, a traditional show to 2,500 bucks to go to the NAMM show, you also have to look at the exposure you get in the numbers and you realize that per imprint, anyways, per person that's going to see your guitars and per qualified buyer and for the exposure from literally the world attends the NAMM show. You know, you're going to have people from Japan and Australia and Germany and the Netherlands and, uh, you know, uh, Dubai, you know, all coming and seeing your guitars. Frankly, it's the, it's the cheapest show in the world for the exposure. Yeah, that, that's understandable. So you had a good result, and uh, obviously that helped facilitate the next go around. But and that and we'll get to uh, 2018. But in the meantime, something else developed. I mean, and and the concept developed a little bit. And I I, I believe that you told me that it was really after that that um, that you broadened it out a little bit and. Let's talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, again, requests. Uh, all, all of this is meeting people's needs. So NAM came to me. We developed the Boutique Guitar Showcase at NAM Show. And then retailers came to me at the 2017 show, starting with Sammy Ash and Ben Ash, uh, who don't even sell boutique guitars. But they came to me and said, hey, we love this. Could you do something like this in our stores? And uh, at first I kind of laughed it off, but you know, really 25 20 years from around the world, hundred guitars, this is no, <laughs> I didn't tell him no, but I thought in my mind, I don't see how. And then, you know, George Groon kept on coming back to the show and the George doesn't even sell new guitars, but he was excited about what he saw. And, he, and so there was conversations there and, you know, the guitar sanctuary were in Dallas and, and next thing you know, there were simply too many people talking about it for me to ignore. And I said, okay, is there a way? to make this happen. And I spoke with the guitar makers, starting with those who were at the NAMM show, BGS, and said, would you be interested if we could do a number of events in high-end boutique guitar shops who are proven sellers every day? They sell high-end specialized guitars. If we could get your guitar in there and do a special event, and it was a reasonable cost for you, would you be interested in that? And so we put together uh, a proposal with seven stores in seven unique cities on the eastern side of the U.S. Eastern simply because I'm based in Toronto. Uh, and so, you know, we started at Rudy's Music in New York City and then, you know, Wilcutt in Lexington and Atlanta with Righteous Guitars. We did Groons, of course, in Nashville, uh, Martin Music in Memphis, uh, the Guitar Sanctuary in Dallas, and on up to making music in Chicago. Seven events, seven unique uh, cities over 10 days. Wow. And that's a, that's uh, we a charged brutal schedule. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a intense schedule. Um, we traveled with a videographer and a small team with 50 guitars and it worked. It worked really well. Um, and you were in a, you were and, in a, uh, a motor home or a bus or something like that. Yeah, it was a motor home. So it was like a 32 foot motor home packed full of guitars yeah, wow. <laughs> and our, and our team. And, uh, and yes, an intense drive schedule of which I do uh, all of that driving, frankly. Wow. Um, <laughs> it was a bit much, frankly, but it worked, it worked really well. Um, the numbers were really high on that, uh, again, also for, uh, for sales and for connections, you know, you have a chance to have, uh, your guitar in their store. And of course, uh, the retailers are more comfortable in their own environment. Their customers are comfortable with that environment. They know which amp to go plug in. They know where, where everything is. You know, they know what the room sounds like, right? And so the customers here, and then the retailers staff have a chance to, to see these things and try it, which of course at the, at the NAMM show that uh, it was really ideal in all of those ways. Uh, and the basic premise was how can I make this work for everyone without anyone risking too much? The retailers already have the space. They already have the clientele. And so if they provide the space and advertise for their clientele, it's not really going to cost them much of anything to do it. How much right? of a, what kind of and, a footprint does it take uh, uh, to do that in terms of in, um, uh, in the, in the store, how big of a space to, uh, did you need? Oh uh, yeah. The stores of course are all quite different uh, in size and the arrangement changed every time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but ultimately if we had an open space, we can do it with about, uh, you know, eight fold out tables with black skirts on them and such. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, but that, that's fairly tight. Mm -hmm. uh, there are there other places where we had more room, you know, the guitar sanctuary in Dallas is a great live venue with a stage and, uh, everything in it where they host events and we had plenty of room there, but, you know, somewhere like Rudy's in New York city, of course, you know, <laughs> not, uh, I think we're jammed in a lot more. It was still, it was still great, but you know, we had to pack things a little tighter. So it depends on the space that we yeah. have to work with, but, right. um, yeah, or if I think the smallest one that we ultimately did was a, a shop in Paris, you know, uh, real estate is really expensive in, in the old city. They're just used to working with smaller spaces than we are in North America. So anyways, uh, it, it, it worked for everyone in a way where it wasn't risking too much. I'm always very keenly aware of how much exposure costs guitar makers, you know, guitar makers, um, are not wealthy people typically, uh, and they have to watch every dollar they're spending. And so uh, we gave them, seven unique events in seven cities uh and it costs 600 bucks which is uh, that was per guitar, that you is. said 600 yeah 600 dollars oh. for per guitar okay a maximum guitar. two guitars Got for it. any uh for any one guitar maker i don't want 10 guitars from one guitar maker you know we need a lot variety and contrast of course and um you know but for, for 600 bucks seven events seven cities that's 86 dollars an event 
you know, I don't know a cheaper it's a way, great to, way to put it. That's a great way to put get it. your guitars into the right people's hands than that. Yeah. Um, you want to say it out loud? I think Jamie, you're nuts. That's way too cheap, <laughs> but, but I know what they have to work with. And so that's what, that's what we need to do. We need to find a way that works for everyone. And, and it did. So they said, do more. And uh, so we booked the Western U S tour and, uh, and then they asked if I could do it in Europe. And so we did, uh, we had seven countries in, in Europe as well. That was fantastic. You know, hard driving again, you know, when you're going from Germany to Denmark to the Netherlands and England and Paris, uh, you know, and, and made up, finish up in Milan. Boy, it sounds uh, like an adventure. Um, you said you had a, a, you know, a cameraman with you. Did you, uh, it almost sounds like you could have done a reality show or a documentary about this thing. Did you capture <laughs> enough video to do that or, or not? We certainly could have. We did not. That wasn't our intention. Honestly, it wasn't my intention to bring a videographer along for the whole thing. I, I did it for the first two or thing. We needed some promo material, but, uh, he's such a great, uh, videographer and he's so creative and quick that uh, he ended up making a video for every single event and we released it within 24 hours. Oh, okay. And then okay. we just kind of set a precedence <laughs> that we sure. make videos for every event. Well, it's a great <laughs> so, way to, it's a great way to, you know, to promote and to have uh, sort of your in-house uh, video uh, is great. It's great. So that, so people were able to see that. And I know that you do have uh, videos available on your website. Uh, yeah, no, so they're on Facebook, they're on, mm. they're on YouTube, they're all over the place. Sure. Um, and so in the end, we ended up producing 28 videos uh, in 2017. Wow. Um, for all the events. And then, then in our travels, we had a couple of days where the driver was, the drive was long and I don't like uh, having down days. And so with the drive, I looked which guitar makers we know in that area. And so we, we stopped and we shot a video with Steve McSwain in Portland and Randy Parsons in Ventura. And then we did two in, uh, in Europe as well, when, uh, in Venice with Enrico Dignato and uh, Vienna with Michael Spalt. And so, sure. um, you know, we keep trying new things. And uh, the whole point is uh, there's so many amazing, interesting guitar makers out there in the world right now that uh, we just want to help spread the word, you know. So help that all took place uh, initially from uh, between NAM 17 and NAM. 18 is that right uh and i know you have other things coming up but um yeah in, in reality that all happened between april and november wow. i don't even know how many months that is but that was it was thirty five thousand kilometers in travel that we did and 20 22 unique events in seven countries um it's pretty <laughs> when i did the recap of the Enero, i went wow no wonder I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine, but it's got to be a just a thrill and a you know and a great sense of accomplishment uh, when you uh, when you finish one of those things up. And there's certainly uh, you know challenges along the way in any of these things, but uh, at the end of the day, which I don't like to say much anymore, <laughs> but uh, it's um, you know it's just a, it's just a great feeling. Now I know you have yeah. events. Uh, planned uh, going forward. What can you tell us about that? What do you What do you got on the on the docket? Sure. So the next uh, the next thing we have on is at the Summer Nam Show. Uh, there is a boutique guitar showcase at Summer Nam. There was last year as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's a different format. It's somewhere between the tours and the winter show. Meaning we have a Nam Show space, um, but the luthiers don't need to fly into Nashville to do the show. Um, we represent the guitars like we do on the tours. Got it. Um, where, you know, it's, it's me and my team, um, the setup of uh, the guitars there. And, and it looks great. It's just much smaller than it is at the winter show. Um, and it was, uh, it was very good last year also. You know, Summer Nam is great for getting press and meeting artists. You don't have, frankly, you don't have the same types of sales that you have at the winter show. But all of the magazines come and they all have time that they just don't have at the winter show. So I've never done the summer now without getting great press. I mean, last year, I think we had a 20 minute interview with guitar world. You know, they, uh, they asked me and Sheldon Dingwall was there with us in the boutique guitar showcase. And, and Sheldon and I sat down with guitar world for 20 minutes and did a video with them, which, which reached a lot of people. So that was fantastic, you know, and reverb covered it and premier guitar covered it and, and on and on and on. And so, um, summer is great for press and Nashville is uh, probably the highest concentration of professional musicians, uh, anywhere in the world. That's right. Um, That's right. You, you trip over great guitar players in Nashville, you know, and uh, and such a unique environment. Jeff, I don't know if you had much chance to spend time in Nashville. Um, but I, 
It's been a while, and I, I am planning to uh, to get back there. My son is living in uh, Western Tennessee for a while, and so I need a, a, I need to get out there. So I'm I, you know I'm hoping maybe there's a way to uh, to kind of work that in. But uh, yeah, but it's but but it's actually been a while. Uh, in my earlier days in the business, uh, we had more reason uh, to be out there. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm hope I'm hoping. But it's a great city. Well, the cool thing about Nashville to me, uh, about the players and the, the culture that exists amongst the musicians, is that there are so many incredible musicians in Nashville that they don't have the same type of big heads as we find in other places. <laughs> you just can't. There's just too many. It, it's, there's great playing. It's just kind of normal. And so, you know, you have to be a, a nice person. <laughs> or else no one wants to have you on the gig, yeah. you know, and it, it, it's, uh, it's different than other cities that have been in that way. And so I, I really love that show. What, so let me ask you this question. Uh, now that you're, you know, you've got some traction for this project and you're getting a lot of attention. Mm. I understand it's a curated project. Uh, you're making the mm -hmm. decisions on, on who you want to come in. Mm -hmm. I, I'm guessing that, that there, there may be people that are approaching you that, that want to, come on to the uh, uh, the program and does that present, uh, you know, any challenge for you at all or how do you handle that? It certainly does. Um, so as, you know, as, as a human, uh, I, I think people should be kind. You know, I think people should be kind and encouraging and I think we should all help each other just have a better life, frankly. You know, um, as a professional, I have to be discerning. And I, and I have obligations to many different types of people and I'm trying to do something very specific with this. Uh, and so uh, those things sometimes feel friction, you know, where I'm looking for unique world-class instrument makers, people that are doing something that other people aren't doing, you know, um, that have a very unique approach to it. Uh, effectively, I'm looking for the ambassadors, the liaisons, you know, the, the, the people who are doing something that is uh, very press worthy and has a place in the market, because I'm not just, you know, I'm not trying to sell a guitar space. Honestly, we could, we could fill these things out over and over again with the amount of people who want to be a part of it. But frankly, I need to bring things that are sellable to the retailers and to the guitar players who come to the events looking for a new guitar. I need to bring them things that are viable and there's all sorts of sellable guitars in the world. There's all sorts of amazing playing guitars in the world and such. But it doesn't make a special event. Exactly. You're right. Uh, and, and I have to, you know, I have a reputation uh, from traveling to music stores for many years. Um, I did spend time on the road as a traveling sales uh, agent and such. And I've been in more than 600 guitar shops in North America. Uh, and I have a reputation of walking through the door, showing people things they've never seen before. And it always blows their mind. It's always super high quality. It's always really unique. And usually it's something that actually causes them to think differently about the guitar. They don't think the same about guitars anymore after you encounter uh, a Teufel birdfish yeah. or a Jens Ritter <laughs> instrument. Or, you know, uh, it, it causes you to see the world differently. Yeah. And that may sound hyperbolic. That may sound ridiculous, but. No, it, I, it's I don't think it does. I mean, I, I mean, I. You know, uh, I, you're preaching to the choir here, but uh, no, I mean, I understand it. I, but I just, I think it's a relevant, a relevant point. You've explained it uh, quite eloquently. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, yes, I have people who contact me who I ask them to please tell me the, what makes your instrument a unique world-class instrument. And, uh, and, you know, generally uh, I always want to keep the door open, you know, I say it's a curated show and I'm looking for very specific things. If it doesn't fit this show, it might fit one in the future. Please always stay in touch with me. Uh, and it's always best to let me know what's developing with your company as well. That's because, the best you know, way I to won't have, yeah. yeah, I won't have three guitars on the tour, which are beautiful Les Paul-like guitars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're great guitars. They're great guitars. Don't get me wrong. But I, I, I might have one of them on the tour. Sure. But I can't have three of them because yeah. I need contrast. I need exactly, difference. exactly. And when you look at your at the display, that's where the uh, the incredible uh, dramatic presence of these things and uh, and the diversity is really seen. 
And I think the diversity is is important. You know, we're certainly going for diversity on this show, which probably explains mm-hmm. why you and and others um, are are on the program. We're trying to you know reach as many people as we can with um, stuff that's uh, of interest and that will be informative and uh, inspiring and uh, entertaining to you know to some degree. So I think there's a uh, there's a little bit of that, uh, of those things in, in everything that you're doing. And, uh, it's just a, a, a sight to see. So let me, let me, uh, kind of close things out with a question that I guess I'm, I'm asking people on a regular basis now, because we've been talking a lot about, uh, in our other segments about, uh, taking businesses or careers to the next level. So you're a real creative person, you know, you have vision, uh, you have some good business sense. So, I'm just kind of wondering, as you look ahead, what do you see uh, as the next level for Jamie Gale? I don't see levels. Uh, I, and and you may put it differently, but but I think you understand yeah. where it's a more of a bigger. No, 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 no I do. Scale. I, you want to ask where I'm where I'm going, but uh, but I think uh, not to be contrary. <laughs> but uh, feel free. I, I do, <laughs> uh, some people can look at a career path like mine and go, "Wow, you know, it's always changing." But for me, it, it's not, obviously, I'm, I'm an explorer. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, and we're looking to create new things. And I'm often contacted when someone hits a bit of a roadblock because there are, there are amazing guitar makers out there who are doing incredible things that have never been done before. And when you create amazing things that we've never seen, there may not be a market for it yet. And so I'm often involved in finding that spot for that finding the right customer, finding the right way to show such a thing. You know, we did that at the NAMM show this last year. I commissioned four guitar makers to do art installations, to show the guitar as a cultural icon has exceeded the bounds of its utility. Some of those uh, installation pieces sold at the show, sold for many tens of thousands of dollars. And and that was a huge success because there are guitar makers who who really uh, see themselves as, as artists who their canvas happens to be a guitar. Um, and so that was a new thing that, that happened at the show. And there are many, many sort of new things. I'm opening up conversations with design schools and, uh, and gallery curators um, and, and guitar players, you know, who maybe see themselves as traditionalists, but they see themselves as a traditionalist who plays a telecaster, which in 19, you know, 49 or 1950, which is not that long ago in the grand scheme of things, you know, Leo Fender came to a guitar show maybe. And he said, what's that? And he said, a guitar. And they said, I don't think so. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's a, I, you know, that's what you take pizzas in the oven with, you know, uh, this slab of wood, you know, and, uh, and now we have traditionalists who think that, uh, you know, that's what a traditional guitar looks like. Uh, and so it's, a, I'm not interested in, just showing guitars um, or selling guitars, uh, frankly, I'm, uh, we're trying to change the way the world thinks. Uh, I want them to be open because I don't think that art should be closed. I don't think that music should be closed. I think there's far more for us yet to discover than we've done yet. Uh, and so uh, maybe not next level, but just on continuing the journey. Yeah. Jeff, I'm excited about the things I don't yet know. <laughs> well, that's a great that's a great vision. You know, nothing wrong with that. There's no rules in this. And you've defined it in terms of what it means to you. And I'm just, um, I'm thrilled to have had you on the show and to present this. Um, I think uh, folks are going to really enjoy it and get a lot out of it. And uh, that's the whole purpose. And I hope that um, we'll stay in touch and you can keep us posted on what's happening and progress. And and, uh, maybe we can talk again uh, in the future and see what's happened uh, in that span of time. Sounds great. We'd love to. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you, Jeff. Take care. Continuing our discussion about taking your business or career to the next level, I talked about implementing your vision and outlined some behavioral characteristics that I believe are critical to the process. Those characteristics are attitude, focus, and knowledge. And in our last episode, I explained my three elements of knowledge, and they are skills, resources, and experience. And remember, this is how I see it. 
I know there are many divergent thoughts and opinions on these topics out there, but I'm giving you this information in what I would say is designed to be foundational in nature, meaning that they are building blocks upon which additional ideas and methodologies are built on. So it's really important that I keep this stuff simple at this point, because it is, and it's always easier to learn and integrate into your thinking, if you so choose. Now, I also hinted in my discussion about knowledge that I would soon be talking about leveraging it. And that's what I'm going to do today in terms of the basics. And by the way, if you've possibly had the sense that all of this information I've been giving you so far feels a bit like an outline, well, your instincts are correct. That's exactly what it is. And down the road, I'll be making that available along with much more on the subject. And we'll let you know about that. So what about this business of leveraging your knowledge to help bring your vision to life in one form or another? Well, first, what does the term leveraging mean here? In our case, I think of it as adding, compounding, or multiplying the value of your knowledge in tangible ways to produce positive outcomes for your business or career. So I would look at leverage as it applies to each of my elements of knowledge, again, skills, resources, and experience. And within each of those elements, I divide them into two categories, internal and external. So let's start looking at it with that structure in mind. First off, let's talk about skills. On the internal side, from my perspective, one of the most important and often one of the most difficult things to manage is the prioritization of your skills. In other words, which of your skills produce the most positive results? Can you answer that question? It may take a little thought, but invest the time and write it out. Make a chart or a grid or a spreadsheet if that helps, but anything that makes it clear to you. The benefits of this should be obvious. Too many people spend too much of their time doing things that don't produce good results. I've seen it a lot, and I'm guilty of it myself. But before I go any further on that, let me clarify something. I'm talking about making priority decisions that have the most direct and positive effect on your business or career. I'm not necessarily talking about making choices of the heart, which may refer to something that you're highly skilled at or passionate about or just love doing. Sometimes those things can represent longer term time investments that may contribute to a good business related outcome down the road, but they may simply take you out of service for a period of time in the short run. So that's another decision you have to make. And it's not to say that you can't do both. You have to figure that out. So does it sound to you like there are some aspects of time management involved here? Probably so. Unfortunately, when the subject of time management comes up, and it's a really, really big topic, most people cringe at least a little bit. And I'm not really going to get into that here today, but prioritizing your skills probably by the very nature of it requires some time management by default. But I can tell you this. The more you understand the relationship between your skills and your business or professional outcomes, the more likely it will be that you can effectively apply those skills in the process. Of course, the more skills you have, the more difficult it may be. And frankly, I'm one of those people. And this is a challenge I have to deal with on a regular basis. You know, there really isn't much in my business in terms of the daily activities and functionality that I can't do and do fairly well. On top of that, I love what I do in the pure sense. The only time that uh, that is diminished is if I happen to be working with a difficult client. And that doesn't happen very often, thankfully. When it does, there's only one solution. Lose the client. But if you're one of those multi-skilled people yourself, and I imagine many of you are, The challenge is to understand the priorities and be disciplined enough to think it through and make decisions that will ultimately help move your vision forward. Now, how about the external applications? This is a little different. Here I'm referring to using your skills through interaction with an external entity of some kind. Usually that's another company or an organization, but it could be an individual as well. These interactions may involve contractual applications, strategic partnerships or relationships, or other kinds of transactional activities. The possibilities may seem endless, and probably they are, but the questions we need to answer have some similarity to our previous discussion. You need to understand which of your skills have the most value external to your own business. And that may involve understanding some market needs and interests, or the needs and interests of a specific entity. 
when you pair those two things together, it should become much clearer to you where the potential opportunities may exist. This is a straightforward exercise, but it does require some thought and effort. Although what meaningful thing doesn't? The good news is that when you take the time to understand even these basic ideas I've given you here today, you'll be in a much better position to leverage your knowledge and take your business or career to the next level. And in the next episode of GBR, we'll continue this discussion as we talk about leveraging the second element of knowledge, and that is resources. I hope you'll join us for that. And remember, if you have any questions or thoughts on any of this, reach out. There are many ways to communicate with us, and I love to hear from you. As always, continue to stay positive. Keep focusing on that destination and make sure that all the options remain open on how you're going to get there. And I'll see you on episode 14. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com.